Welcome to episode 11 of Unexceptional Moms. My name is Ellen Stumble, and joining me today is my husband, Andy. And this is Erin Lorraine, and I'm here with my husband, Larry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, <laughs> they are going to cause trouble, I promise. They are going to cause trouble, which is, we already had fun, fun <laughs> podcast with them. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to talk about marriage, which obviously is why we asked our husbands to join us. So first we're going to talk about the challenges. We are going to talk about marriage tips and things that are helpful for marriages. We're going to talk about resources. And although it seems that this doesn't fit in because we don't know when we will be able to convince our husbands to join us again, um, we were asked about how dads deal with the diagnosis. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, one thing, there's no freebie this time. Every resource is just going to be directly on the post. So ellenstumble.com forward slash episode 11 with the number. You're going to find all of this information. So with that, what are the challenges of raising kids with disabilities? Wow. That's such an open-ended question. I think a big one for us is um, child care. Hmm. is very difficult. We can't just hire the kid down the street. Yes. And therefore, that affects our ability to get out, go out on dates, do things together. Um, that makes it very challenging. I also think that it's tough as, as a father to come home after working all day and see how much the kids have worn our wives down. Hmm. And that we also need to step in and help out with dishes and so on. So we can also be tired, but it's almost like a second job mm -hmm. that a lot of our peers does, don't have. Um, not that they don't help with dishes. Not that they don't help with dishes, but along with the other issues that come along with. Right. Mm -hmm. And also blessings, but. Right, I would say that even though we have older kids now, they still require a level of emotional energy that a normal or child that's nine, 10 or 11 would require. And so I think one of the challenges is then the draining aspect of dealing with normal growing, growing challenges that kids have, but then also their uh, physical challenges that you're having to help them with uh, or their emotional challenges that are not normally having to be dealt with, but we have to. Uh, those kind of things are what, in the long run, really begin to wear on us. Mm -hmm. How do you guys deal with just being brought down? What brings you guys up as a couple and fills each other's cups? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think it's easy to have the kids uh, kind of tear you apart a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, even this morning we had a situation where we handled it differently and it, it pulls you apart. I think it's taking time after those happen to make sure you reconnect, uh, to clarify what were you thinking? What was I thinking, feeling, mm -hmm. make sure you, um, have time to, um, communicate and, and, uh, show some affection and be, be able to build that back up. Otherwise it just kind of lingers long, long and longer. And I think, and I don't know with you guys, but personality has so much to do with that. And I'm a very emotional person. Mm -hmm. So if, if I um, feel stressed about kids, then I feel stressed with him for no reason at all. I think there's been times that he's walked in and I'm yelling at him and I'm angry and say, what are you angry with me? And I'll say, I don't know, but there must be something which is kind of illogical, but it's the reality of my personality, my poor husband. Yeah. Having to put it with me. These but. are all things that apply to every family. They just mm -hmm. they're magnified yeah. Right. Yes. when you're when you have children with special needs. Well, because and we're I, already wore out and it's harder for me to do something to encourage Erin when I'm already wore out. Right. And for her to do vice versa. Right. So a lot of times when we walk into a situation. It's hard for me to say, well, Aaron's love language is words of affirmation. And I'm totally bad with that. So when I walk in the door and I see that the house is cleaned up, which I know is a huge sacrifice for her, 
I yeah. need to get to say yes. something because it just doesn't come to mind. And it, that really tears you down sometimes, tears her down. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that just makes that situation harder because we walk in the door and our first scenario is to, to be there for our wives and try to jump in and we don't really see what's going on around us a lot. At least I don't. Well, I think our natural inclination when we get emotionally torn down, worn down, is that we turn inward and we look only what what I need, my wants, and uh, we can become very selfish. Yeah. Sounds like you're wrestling with not doing that. What have you done to keep that from happening where you just, I've done my duty of providing for the family Mm -hmm. and I'm out of here. I'm doing my own thing tonight. Yeah. Well, it's, I think it's tough. We were just talking today about, you know, when we get in those situations, we tend to kind of give ourselves our own narrative, which is mostly a a selfish narrative. And Mm -hmm. so we're telling ourselves, I'm doing the dishes. You know, I need, I'm here doing this. I'm here doing that. When the reality is we're both doing a lot of hard work. It's just that I'm not seeing everything that Aaron's doing all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, That's very true. And, and it's really comes down to the communication aspect of, honey, I'm wore out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How can we do this together? Yeah. Right. As a team. And I think it's important to point out that those narratives or things you run through your head 90% of the time are not accurate. No. Right. Right. But the other part of that is they build on each other in a sense that it starts as a minor grievance mm-hmm. and then it becomes another thing and another thing. And that's where the communication piece is so important that if we don't work on getting back to that level of being connected, then it does just continue to, that divide continues to grow. You're absolutely right. And it's harder as we, we push ourselves into isolation, which we've totally been in, to come back together. It takes so much more work. Mm-hmm. I know for me, a big challenge sometimes, especially, you know, when Andy would come home five or six o'clock from church before, mm-hmm. as soon as he walked in the door, I was checked out. Right. Mm-hmm. It was like, daddy is home. I'm done. Mm-hmm. And even now, you know, when he's around, I think you can get in bad patterns where that becomes where you naturally tend to go towards mm-hmm. that one person you know who's in charge who's doing whatever it is and for me it's really easy to fall into that well dad's here so mm-hmm. he can yeah. take care of it right yeah and the theme there is communication mm-hmm. right communicate, communicate communicate which is the foundation of every relationship really mm-hmm. and i would even say for for couples um with kids with special needs over communicate Yes. You, I don't think you can communicate enough. What is, what's your schedule? We always ask each other, what's your schedule for the day? So there's no confusion. Um, communicate about your needs. Communicate about your frustrations. Talk, 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 talk. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's so important. And that's not easy to do. Mm-mm. That's probably one of the hardest things to do. And that's exactly where Satan wants us to be is not communicating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you guys do to create space for that something that we run into and i don't know if this is how you wanted this to go <laughs> something well, that we run you know. into is that <laughs> honesty we um i'll be working on something and she tries to come in and talk and i'm then bothered because well, i was really focused on this or that happens that she's very much focused on something and then i'm like wanting to talk about ellie or mm-hmm. and she doesn't want to and then i'm frustrated last night <laughs> <laughs> that's why <laughs> Um, and so my, uh, what have you guys learned to try to keep that, the level of communication yeah. open? Yes. Well, I think that we have been in those situations where we basically gotten to the point where we're not talking at all. We're kind of almost pushing each other away because I, I then too start to, to tell myself my own narrative of what's going on. But we really do have to be intentional about when I walk in the door, how was your day? What's going on? You know, how can I help? Um, what we found is Erin will continue to do something and assume that I know that she needs help. Mm-hmm. Right. So I had to basically ask her and say, do you need help? Or 
you need to be, you need to tell me that you need help because otherwise I'm going to go on and do what I think needs to be done. Which is usually the last thing on my list of priorities. And then I'm frustrated, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because we're different people. Yeah. You know, if we were the same, then that would be weird. Larry takes Mondays off and he works at a church. And so he works Saturday, Sunday, takes Mondays off. Well, all four of our kids are gone on Mondays. Mm -hmm. And I find that we do this the whole time and just process life. And I just think that it might not be a whole day, but finding that time to process life together, if it just means um, running up to a coffee shop and talking for half an hour or locking yourself in the bedroom after the kids are in bed and talking. But that connection point is so important. And the earlier, the better, the earlier in the day, the better. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I I think something that I've found helpful is to ask her instead of just blurting out what I'm trying to say, Mm -hmm. say, Hey, when would be a good time that we can talk for a few minutes and try to create that communicating that I want to talk but not demanding it has to be at this very moment. Yes. And there's been times then, because usually we go on day dates on Fridays, but there's been times that he's even said, you know, I have these two things that I really want to talk to you about. And maybe he'll say it on Wednesday. And he's like, we can talk about it on Friday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll go out and then he'll bring those up. And Okay. So you transitioned me. Let's talk about dating. Dating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I think both of our families are in different situations where, you're, like you said, working at a church, you usually have a week day off. Mm-hmm. Then if you take advantage of the daytime to be together, it helps a lot. It does. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think for us, now that we have kind of switched, you know, not roles because that's not it, but we have, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to work and he's studying full time. Um it's different because I feel like we have a lot of time at home, but that doesn't mean that we're connecting and we're sure. talking all the time. I'm doing my thing. I'm working. He's doing his thing. He's working. So first of all, I think that just shows that you have to be so intentional. You yeah. can't just assume it's going to happen. You will have to be intentional about it. Yes. And I think the other thing is we have this concept of what a date looks like and we have to reprogram our minds to recognize that, Maybe that means going into lower work late. And so you get an hour or two together or taking a longer lunch. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, then also, and this is something that we really believe is that you have to schedule sometimes that are longer than just maybe a regular date would be that you uh-huh. put a day away or a weekend away. Otherwise you're not building into that, into your marriage enough to really strengthen it. Uh-huh. You're right. And when we worked with family life, um, a lot of times, so they have the weekend to remember, which is one of the resources that I was going to share, which is a weekend marriage conference. And we would ask people about going and they would say, oh no, our marriage is fine. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was one of the most frustrating things for me because that's exactly when you should be going. Um, what, what was your little phrase you said today? I'm sure you've heard it before, but the worst time to fix a hole in the roof is during a storm. Right. So good point. When we do these proactive things, when we um, seek counseling sooner rather than later as a couple or individually to help guide us, when we go to marriage conferences, even when our marriage is doing well, mm-hmm. we're building that up yeah. and, um, and we need to do that before it starts to crumble. Yes. You know, when we did premarital counseling, I do remember that um, the couple that we did the counseling with they recommended, they said every year take a weekend away mm-hmm. um, and try to go to a marriage conference. Like mm-hmm. try to do that every year. And we have not done a conference every year, um, but we have taken mm-hmm. a weekend or a week away around our anniversary just to have that. But they said uh, marriage conference or marriage counseling. Oh, and yeah. They yeah. helped to paint the picture that counseling doesn't have to be only when things are totally broken. Once the house is burned down, then you try to put it back together. It's right. putting out fires earlier and repairing things a lot earlier. So that was um, normalizing the idea of, of counseling. And I've loved it. I mean, we've done it twice and I've loved it. And obviously, Andy's going to be a counselor. So we're right. we believers yeah. in counseling, but yeah. it makes a difference. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, absolutely. things that come up that I remember thinking, I didn't know that was an issue, but apparently it is. Right. You know, even if you're communicating all the time, just to have someone that you can talk to that can point things out and, you know, say, do you notice the body language? You know, even those little things are really helpful. Totally. Tone of voice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, communication styles that we don't see outside of ourselves. Mm-hmm. That we just assume the other person knows. So ultimately, I think one of the important things is we need to put our marriage first. And that is so hard with yes. families with kids with special needs. Mm-hmm. Our girls require so much of our time and attention physically and emotionally. Um, and that can easily become a trap mm-hmm. that your children become your everything. And um, so how do you guys avoid that? Well, I think Ellen naturally does that. I mean, she's always made it a good, made it a priority. And since that's part of it is making the choice ahead of time that we're not going to let our kids be the center of everything in our world. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so that means we can't do every activity. And, um, but yeah, that's, there are certain times I think that your kids have to take center stage you know, maybe during a surgery that yeah, uh, absolutely, it kind of changes things. And so that means going with the flow a little bit to say we have to um, give and take on when that mm. is. But um, it's just basically re, I mean, being committed together that we're going to make this the main priority. And so when it lessens, you reinvest. Yeah. Other thing too that, we have to watch out for, I think is especially with one of our girls can, can set one of us off at any time. Right. And so she's really setting the temperature of the home then. Mm-hmm. Yep. And she knows that she knows exactly what she's doing, but it's so much harder to, to bring the thermostat back down after that happens. So have you all done anything in the past to try to keep that from happening or been in that situation where? You know, I'm trying to think that I would say the hardest times in our marriage have been directly correlated to the hardest times Mm -hmm. for kids. Yeah. And, um, Parenting kids with trauma is like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. Trauma Mm -hmm. affects everybody in the family. Yes, it does. I would say I come from a family of people who yell, but Andy does not. So I think at the beginning of, you know, in our marriage, I felt like when I would get up high, you know, high in that level, he wouldn't respond that way. And that would help me kind of come back. But I find that in that kind of situation, I don't, you know, come down. And sometimes, I mean, uh, you know, as calm as he can be, you know, I can feel that he does feel that, you know, like he's rising, I guess you could say. Um, And I don't know that, that I would say that I'm very aware of how we have brought it down as much as he's just more, like I said, I'm I'm more emotional and I, you could say volatile, volatile, like how do you say that? Anyway, and he's more, you know, even keel and he's Mm -hmm. better at bringing us together, you know, or like making a plan. And maybe that's what it is. Like, this is the problem. Let's try this and see how it's working. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think he's, um, he's smart enough to know when I need to be removed from a situation. (laughs) Yes. What honey, you need to go to the room, read, check Facebook, whatever you need to do. Let me deal with it because you know, I'm just so, um, emotional. Yeah. It's somewhat like tag team parenting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also because, I mean, as you talk together about how you're going to do this or how, how to do it together is that idea of, we would remind each other that, remember, we're on the same team. Mm-hmm. And that was something that we had talked about beforehand that now when we remind each other of that, it's like, oh yeah. Okay. Yep, I'm, I'm against you right now, but I don't want to be mm-hmm. on the same team here. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to choose to do this together. And uh, so even though I'm angry at, at you right now, uh, we're still going to figure out how to do this as uh, together one mm-hmm. and not at each other. 
And Angie's much better at reminding me of that. Huh? The, the, phrase that the phrase that family life uses is your spouse is not your enemy. Mm -hmm. We have an enemy. We do. It's yeah. not my spouse. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's um, talk about, because I think this is so important to, to marriage, what it looks like to get help for your family mm. to make your lives, um, I don't know, easier in a sense so that you can be building into your marriage. So for us, it was, it was getting respite and it was a long journey mm. to get that. And I did not want it. Mm. Um, I did not trust anyone to care for my girls and Larry wanted it very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's turned out to be the best thing we've ever done. But I think that is so important to have people and, and help in place for you. One of the things we started doing, what, six months ago is having our house cleaned. Yeah. I am willing to sacrifice something financially so that that is one more thing off the weight off of me. Because Larry would walk in at night and he'd feel like he needed to clean to help me. Mm -hmm. But what I needed was help with the kids, but I needed the house clean too. And it was just so frustrating. And it was a constant source of frustration for us. Mm -hmm. And we removed it. Mm -hmm. And just going back to respite a little bit, because I think that's a huge deal for a lot of couples. You know, when do we go out? I think it's a good idea to point out that you – you found that respite through qualified providers and agencies. Mm -hmm. Like your kids are not the kind of kids that you can just go, like you said, and ask the babysitter or even ask your friend from church. No. no. Like you need someone that's very much trained to yes. work with your girl. Oh yeah. I love it when people offer to come watch Oksana in particular. I, mm -hmm. I really try to resist laughing hysterically, <laughs> but no. Um, and for our boys too. Um, so one of the reasons I finally gave in and moved forward with respite mm -hmm. is because um, I told the boys that we had found this respite place. So Oksana once a month goes to a weekend long respite program. She loves it. Mm -hmm. It's Friday night to <laughs> Sunday night and they do field trips and cooking activities and we've gotten to know the staff so well there and it's been absolutely wonderful. But um, I didn't want to do it at first, and but when I mentioned it to my boys, one of them cheered. Yes. And I went, oh, okay. Yeah. I have to do this. If for yes. no one else, which it needed to be done for us, mm -hmm. my boys need to breathe for a little while, yes. you know. We did find that we were that happy little frog that jumped in the pot of water swimming around, mm -hmm. but yet the pot started boiling. Little by little, little by, by little. little. And then... Before we knew it, it was boiling and we couldn't get out. Yeah. So, there, go ahead. No, I was going to say there, there are agencies that do have qualified people. And I think that sometimes it's really daunting to mm -hmm. find those places of respite. And Erin, I want to say that we linked to um, Kira Dieter's respite guideline before, but I'll do that again for this okay. time. Um, because there are places that provide the respite and agencies, and there's funding for those um, situations. I think that every state has a regional center. Uh, Department of Mental Health is what it's under. And there's a lot of funding through there, too, because that's their job is to help you find the funding to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you are lucky enough to have one of those kids that you can have a family member or a friend watch them, do it. Use it. I, I didn't yes. enough. I didn't trust anyone and it would have been worth it to just trust someone mm -hmm. as long as they are alive. When you come back home, yeah. it's all good yes. because yes. you got out and you built into your marriage yes. and that's so important. The next step we're finding is having someone in the home to help with Oksana as she's getting older. Um, that's able to bathe her. Like tonight we had dinner mm -hmm. or a respite provider or, one-on-one, -on -one, I guess you can call her, actually took her in the bathroom and bathed her, got her ready for bed. While we dealt with the rest of the family and, mm -hmm. and finished dinner and said, and so. Mm -hmm. um, but that took a long time to take that step. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that hope is huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Back to your original question, Aaron, about how to create space so that we can build into our marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one thing is um, letting go of expectations Mm -hmm. that our family needs to function like so and so, or we need to do this like because that's what my parents would think we should do. Mm -hmm. Or the holiday season, we should be hitting all the activities because all the other families are doing it. Exactly. And so I think our stress level goes up and up and up because we have these expectations of, well, we should be able to do that. We, if we were normal, we'd do this or so-and-so expects us to do this. And I think there's a point of saying, I'm going to let go of that expectation. That's right. I'm not my dad. I'm not so-and-so. And and I don't care if this is a mess right now, we're going to accept it and move on. I'm not the stress going to decline then. One of those things is I have family that lives about 45 minutes away. And so sometimes we will go out there for different activities. So now you've got a 45 minute drive, um, a house that is not handicapped accessible, Mm -hmm. that Oksana cannot maneuver through well, that Anya will blow through like a tornado and have her hands on everything. So it we never got any, we never got to talk to anyone because we were constantly tag teaming the girls. Right. And we always try to make it out there if we can to see everyone. But sometimes it's okay that we just say, we're not going to make this one because it is way more effort than we can even give right now. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that's accepting. Uh, it's recognizing the boundaries that we have and are the limits that we have that we can't yes. do everything and so we're being stretched by our our nuclear family and so we can't do what everybody else does at times uh-huh. exactly uh-huh. we've had similar situations to what you're describing that we say you know that really doesn't work for us mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and then yep. our stress level goes way down mm-hmm. right yes, exactly. exactly or there's been times that we've pushed it because we felt the obligation so i think about one time we were in montana visiting his parents and They had a church service out in the mountains and (laughs) see his wrath. And even as we were driving, you could feel that stress and tension mounting and mounting and mounting. And I the really smart thing would have been for us to say, we're turning around, we're going home. But we felt like we have to go. Mm. And it was horrible. I mean, yeah. I can't remember one good thing about that trip. And and they had said that the kids could go swimming. It was freezing cold. I mean, it, nothing about it worked for our kids. <laughs> yes, nothing worked. It was really horrible. And I feel like, you know, when you feel that tension and you kind of, anything he says bothers me, everything I say bothers him and we're just not connecting. And as we were driving back, we were like, let this be a lesson. Mm-hmm. And when we're, when we know it's going to be really hard, because there's something already happening, right? It's okay to say no. It is okay. It didn't help that we got lost for a half hour. <laughs> it didn't help either, no. <laughs> oh, no. So awful. how do you deal with communicating to your parents mm. in that situation? That's because hard. I know there's a lot of guilt. We have very different parents. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a sense of trying to help them understand as best as you can and being thankful when you feel like they get it and uh, just accepting the fact that they're never fully going to understand your situation. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and yet also keeping some boundaries that, that we can't, I have three siblings and they are, their family's function different than, different than ours does. So I have to just accept that's a reality. Yep. Um, so I think it's kind of deciding together. Mm-hmm. Yes, this will work or not a good idea. Mm-hmm. And then trying to explain that to parents and letting that be enough, I guess. Mm-hmm. And you know, as, when we talk about different parents, because I come from a Mexican family, you know, we, we yell, we're allowed, we tell each other what we think the other person should do. <laughs> um, so I think we get from my mom more like, you need to do this. And why are you doing that? But I mean, she asked that of my sisters and she asks that about everything. So mm-hmm. yes, yeah, sometimes it's bothersome, but it's part of the, the culture, I guess. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't bother me as much because then I can yell back at her and say, well, leave me alone. You don't understand, you know? And, and she's okay with that because that's just part of our dynamic. Um, mm-hmm. But they're not saying that it has not been, you know, frustrating or that it hasn't been 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, difficult at sometimes when you want your family to understand so they can help you, you know? So when they see something even in the marriage, you know, well then help me. Don't criticize it, but help me. Yeah. Yes. But I do think what Andy said is so important. There comes a point where we can be as gracious as we can be to try to explain, but then if they just don't understand, we have to be okay with that because we ultimately we want to keep our family sane. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and just as a segue, we, and I don't know if my mom ever listens to the podcast, but if you mom, do, hi. Yeah. <laughs> if you do, at the same time, I would say um, she re she really gets it. You know, like I trust my mom yeah. with my yeah. kids a hundred percent, and yeah. it's not a bad situation. I right. guess. Right. I love you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're the one who wanted to talk about sex, and you're wondering if your mom is... Because somebody listening. asked that question. So are we going to address it or not? <laughs> okay, person who... <laughs> <laughs> okay, person who important. asked that question... I cannot. <laughs> what if my children listen to <laughs> that's the That's the one reason we're not uh, talking about this, is because... But, you're if you have... want to message us, we'd be happy to talk. Yes, about we can talk about. Um, yes, try to find ways that you can be intimate. Can we leave it at that? Yes. Okay. It's okay to plan. Get a plan. It's okay to plan. It's okay to plan. It is. Be creative. For anybody that watched Parenthood, Funky Town. Yes. Oh, yes. You can plan it. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, moving it's, on. It's okay to have dessert sometimes. <laughs> Stop. That's and sometimes it's like a seven course meal. Oh yeah, yeah, that part, yes. But uh, and sometimes I like fast food. <laughs> <laughs> Variety is good. Doesn't have to be the same every time. Is that enough? That's that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, something that's good for marriage, and we talked about that. Build into yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, taking care of yourself is important to taking care of your marriage. We don't have anything to give if we don't have anything in us, right? No. Right. And, and so what does that look like? Well, I know you take ballet lessons. I do take adult ballet, which is absolutely hilarious. Oh. I'm not a ballerina, but it is really fun. I wish there was something like that for me. I do Zumba. Yes, you do. You do. Mm -hmm. What do you do? That's a really good question. Play guitar? Yeah. It's sort of your job too. Sort of, yeah. So it depends. What about you, Andy? Well, I just give all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he wants he was going to cause trouble. Yes. Sports I, count? I don't know. Now that I don't play piano for church, I'm finding renewed energy in playing for myself. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so I like to go running more, but I don't, I don't get out. I really feel refreshed going for a run. I, it's hard to get the time for that for me. Yeah. It is. Really it is hard very to, hard. It's exercise. Um, That's hmm. a constant battle here is yes. finding time to exercise. Because mm -hmm. when you get up in the morning, you get so many people to get ready and then it's time to go. Yeah. Really, it takes two people every morning. If I didn't teach Zumba, I don't know that I would do it, to be honest. Right. Right. Because I would have lots of reasons. Mainly, I would sleep in. Nah. Is that uh, true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would. It's my favorite pastime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mine too. Hey, but that's really important though. I mean, people without sleep yes. are much more um, you're agitated. agitated. You're less likely to be patient. Yes. You're less likely to be giving. And it's necessary. Then you're so tired you don't want dessert. Exactly. <laughs> now who's talking? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. Saying thank you. We talked well, about that. Yes. And we just talked about gratitude in general. Yes. And it's so easy. Kind of, you brought up a little bit, like, to think, well, here I am doing the dishes. Mm -hmm. What is he doing? It's so easy to find the things they do wrong. And so we have to be intentional about finding the things our spouse does right and building into our spouse. So we're talking about ways to build into our marriage, right? Well, yes. I didn't know we adjusted to another level here. 
sorry. No, we're talking, she, we were talking about gratitude, saying right. thank you. So gratitude is when we, we, I thought that's what the way to build into our marriage yes. was gratitude yes. and yes. taking time for yourself. Yes. But we're expanding on the, on the thankfulness, the okay. gratitude. All right. Gotcha. Be thankful for me. <laughs> it's a little random. We'll be good. Well, and it goes a little bit with love languages because my love language is words of affirmation. And so yes. he can thank me all day long and I will be the happiest person on earth. But um, if he brings me a gift, that doesn't mean a lot to me, right? You know, I know that it's going to be one of the resources you mentioned later on. Um, but Shanti Feldhahn, who wrote For Women Only and For Men Only, her it's husband, Jeff, uh, which is a great book. She wrote a book after that, and she interviewed several couples that have been married for 40 plus years. And the one thing that was a common denominator was that they said thank you to each other. Hmm. And that's how they really formed that relationship mm -hmm. and had a strong relationship throughout the years mm -hmm. because they really had gratitude for each other, hmm. um, which is hard sometimes. It's it is. You know, I've been doing the year of thankfulness and I tried to do that with Andy, but I don't, I have not been that consistent, which is true. You can, you what do you know. mean do it with me? To be thankful. <laughs> I wasn't going there. That wasn't my question. <laughs> to say thank you to you, everything oh, for to say something thank you. that you've done. <laughs> oh my I got to say thank you a lot too, but it doesn't come out of your mouth. It's a problem. Always thinking. That's why we don't have the husbands for the podcast around very often. <laughs> and they missed out on the whole planning part. That was, yes. I can see how finding things to be thankful for in your spouse helps them feel noticed and built up and encouraged. So I can yes. see that's a good, that's a good thing to work on. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. So should we discuss some resources? Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to say one more thing first. Yes, sir. Resources. You guys talked a few times about the idea of the narrative that's in our head. Mm -hmm. And I think something that I've found very beneficial is to think when, I, when I'm finding myself in those thoughts that are usually pretty negative to say, well, where do I want this story to go? Mm. Where do I want this story to end? If I was to write future chapters, what do I want that to look like? Yes. And so that kind of helps redirect that negative energy to say, mm. I do want a really fulfilling marriage. I and like that. So sure, I'm feeling this part of my story right now, but the story that we're going to keep writing together is headed that direction. So mm -hmm. yes, that's great. That's perfect. I know. It's nice to be married to the counselor. Yeah. <laughs> he can counsel me because I need help. <laughs> resources. Um, so when we wrote our resources, we both had uh, the books, for women only and for men only. Yes, they're fantastic. Yes. I think when I read for women only, she says, don't ask your husband those questions. And I couldn't. And I asked uh -huh. him. Every woman I know could not not ask right. those questions. Right. And it was eye-opening. I felt like I went yes. from, from just knowing how men work to actually understanding. Mm -hmm. Yes how men work. And I thought it was actually a great marriage book because it yes. does, helps you in your relationship with your spouse. And I tried to read the one for women, but I thought it was so boring. Like, duh, of course, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it makes sense because I'm a woman. Right. And I think Andy found it good, helpful. Yeah. Andy has dessert on his mind. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's used those books from, uh, premarital counseling too when you did counseling with a couple of yeah yeah, yeah i did mm -hmm. um we talked about the five love languages which yes. we didn't talk a lot about that but it's a good idea to know what your spouse's love language is yes and you can go online to the five love languages and do a very quick and easy free assessment mm -hmm. and i will link to that and the whole basis of that is we show love in the way that we um want to receive like love feel loved right so if my love language is words of affirmation and his is physical touch i can um tell him how amazing he is all day long and it's not going to mean anything it's like you're speaking different languages language. yeah mm -hmm. speaking totally. different languages yep <laughs> yes and it okay. happens and sometimes it's a good idea to try to remember then yes maybe awesome. your spouse <laughs> you so know 
that shows love in another way because mine is physical touch. And there are times that I'm just like, hi, honey, you know, and I want to kiss him and touch him. And he's like, I can see that he's just enduring. It's that he can move on and continue to do what he was doing. I can relate to that. And I said, but I'm loving you right now. Mm -hmm, I'm enjoying it, <laughs> you know? What's your love language, Andy? Quality time. And ah. I, I think words of affirmation. Wow. Mm -hmm. That man bun looks awesome on you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, what else do we have? Um, well, we talked about the weekend to remember. And that's... Yeah. Family life in general, if you go to their website, they have a billion resources and they have them for step families and marriage and parenting and yes. anything you can imagine. But their weekend to remember is their weekend long marriage conference. Um, you can go to weekend to and find out when it will be in your area. Um, it's amazing, mm -hmm. like marriage changing. And then they also have what's called the art of marriage, which is like a, a smaller condensed version a video based a video based that happens within a church it's usually on a friday night and saturday morning mm -hmm. or they've got a small group study where people can get together and go through it individually what's that called again art of marriage the art of marriage okay um now we talked about counseling and again counseling is not something that you do because your marriage is going through a hard time right mm -hmm. i mean Yes, it helps. Well, but, of course it is. Yes. Um, right. But it's just something that you do because it's just, it's good for the relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, counseling is just helpful for everybody, but anything that you would add to that? About counseling? Mm -hmm. We already said that. Okay. So moving on. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy brought up Creating a Better Marriage. Who was the author? That is by Jim Burns. Okay. I think he has lots of good resources too. Uh, not just on uh, that one book that uh, I really value what he has to say. So I think he's worth looking up. Okay. His main point was uh, that we need to create marriages that are full of awe, affection, warmth, and encouragement. Mm -hmm. And we focus on those three things. We are creating the atmosphere that will help a marriage grow together. So lots of flirting with each other. Mm. Does that create awe? <laughs> Okay, and then The Sacred Marriage, Gary Thomas. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time since I read that. But mm -hmm. th isn't that the one that the whole premise is that marriage isn't to... Make us happy. It's to make us holy. But that God has brought us together because... So the very reason it's hard is because he's wanting to use it to make us more like him. Right. Yes. And so it is that sacrament of sorts that that is what he's using to reshape... and and take all of our rough edges that that's comes together in a marriage to, to reshape us. So it gives meaning to the hard stuff. Right. Right. And Aaron, did you have any more resources? No, I think that was it. Okay. So super quick, if we can do this because we did have someone ask about since the husbands are here and we don't know when we're going to get them to do this again. Can't be saying no, shaking his head, saying no. Um, but, you know, women deal with a child's diagnosis a little bit different than men do. So maybe just kind of to share a little bit, what was it like for you to deal with your child's diagnosis? And I know that it's different because we had a biological child first, and then we adopted, and both of your girls have been adopted. So, Andy. That's interesting. Oh. Oh, Andy, you want to go? No, you, because you were ready. So you go, Larry. Go, go, go. What's, what's interesting, Larry? <laughs> it's interesting to hear your story. Um, <laughs> no, but it's interesting, though, is Erin is more like Ellen, more emotional based. Mm -hmm. So she will hear the diagnosis and really go down almost the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is I'll try to push her back to medium ground and sometimes I feel like that's that I'm not even considering the diagnosis I'm thinking more about how she's reacting mm -hmm. to it does that make sense yeah mm -hmm. um, and so I in the past the diagnosis really haven't affected me a ton mm -hmm. in that aspect mm -hmm. Do you think that part of it is because you guys chose to adopt 
mm-hmm. with disabilities. Although, again, I've yeah. said this before on this podcast, the mental illness was not our no, choice. Chosen. That was our big surprise diagnosis. Yes. Um, and I think uh, Larry's point being, I think he does eventually grapple with the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. It just takes him longer because he's too worried about me yes. is really what it boils down to. Mm. I was going to say for myself that I, I don't feel like it took me very long to accept that Nicole was going to be different. Uh, I think it took me a couple of days, really. And then I'm ready to embrace this child and learn and grow I think the hard things have come as you see reality, you know, then trying to wrestle with her reality because she has special needs. Mm-hmm. The other day I said, I don't know if it's harder to watch her stand alone in the playground or to watch her try to interact with others and fail. Mm-hmm. You know that, so it's, it's trying to wrestle with some of the realities of, you know, it's tough for her to interact socially. Mm-hmm. And it's tough for people to understand her. And she gives a little bit, uh, different so it's it's watching those kind of things that um just re visiting it and again saying but you know as frustrating as nicole can be she can also be as uh so rewarding and so it's, it's just the whole picture uh balances it out over time and i just want to say that daddy's the favorite hmm. so, well actually aunt nick auntie nick is right auntie now nick. the uh, second dad <laughs> Yes. It has an imaginary family, right? The now. imaginary family, yeah. yes. However, when I would pick her up at school, she would be like, "No, mom, I want dad." And then he would go on Fridays because it was his day off, and she would be so excited, and he would just smile like, "Yeah, yeah she loves me." <laughs> and I was just like, "Chop liver." Now she still prefers Dan. Sometimes. I'm, Anya's a mommy's girl. She is. I don't think I have any girls that are mommy's girls. I think I had all mommy's kids, but the boys now, I mean, after the boys grew and Anya now thinks daddy's the best thing on earth, but mommy still needs to be there. Yes. Um, mm. Yeah. That's interesting. And Oksana's She's, pretty equal with both she of is us. Pretty equal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anya is getting over you though. <laughs> never get over me. You're like so last year. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because it wasn't that long ago that she was, Anytime Aaron would leave the house, yes. she would run to the door and just collapse. She would lay, start whining. She would, she lay, would lay in front of the floor. door like this so I wouldn't leave. But yes. still to this day, if I put my shoes on, she tells like, me, take them off. Take them off because she knows that means I'm leaving her. Yes. Wow. She's hidden so, her keys before. Mm-hmm. There were times that Andy would leave and Nicole would be sad and go to the door and fall on the ground and cry. Yes. And he would come back like an hour later and she, I could not get her up. She was still waiting and crying. <laughs> By the door. Oh. So that's the love of that little girl for her daddy. Wow. Yeah. And when he came to the diagnosis, he did. He dealt with the diagnosis much sooner than I did. Because I remember when she was two weeks old at the hospital, uh, he said, if God right now came to us and said, would you like me to take the Down syndrome away? What would you say? And I remember feeling like, I, I, I don't know. And he said, I wouldn't do it. You know, like, God created her exactly the way that he did. And, and he's the one that told me, you know, God does give us sometimes more than we can handle. But he was, you know, thinking and processing how God had entrusted us with this precious child. So I feel like he came around that much sooner than I did. Mm-hmm. Yes. Hmm. I got there eventually, but not as soon as quickly. Right. right. I do think as men, we process things completely different. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm not processing it at the depth of emotion Ellen was because she had expectations for her daughters yes. that she had dreamed of and thought of, and I hadn't thought of those things. I wonder if that's different for, for parents of boys that have special needs for their fathers. Hmm. That's a good point because they, you know, you have visions of I'm going to grow up and teach them to play ball. Right. And, and yeah, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, Interesting. Bad girls. Okay. Well, I think that's a good wrap up. So we talked about why parenting kids with disabilities is hard. We talked about some um, marriage tips and things that have been helpful for us. Talked about resources and the dad's dealing with the diagnosis. So anything that you guys want to add in your no, first and last podcast? I'm just yeah. 
Well, I don't think we discussed what we're going to do next week, so we don't know. But eventually, we need to get our our sib- typical siblings in here too. Yes, it would hmm. be great. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Anything else? No. Okay. Well, then that means that until next week, we'll see you guys. Bye. Bye. Adios. <laughs> Adios, amigos. <laughs>